Ladies and gentlemen, back in the day when we did our logic component series, we took a look at several kinds of components, right? Things like gates, your latches, your flip-flops. But we sort of discussed them in a very abstract context. The thing is, in the real world, we definitely don't have like, you know, a giant logic gate that we somehow attach to our circuits. So then what does it really look like? Today, we try to study this. We try to take a look at how you know, it works, how we connect it all together in the real world. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So basically what I've done is I've actually gotten my hands on these little IC chips, right? So I have one here and I have another one that actually has been hooked up to an Arduino board with you know, code and everything running properly. So what we're going to do today is we're going to try and understand them better, right? We're going to try and look at these little IC chips because they are what houses our logic gates. But before we even go there, before we go, you know, to the Arduino code and everything, let's start simple. What exactly do those chips do? How do they work, you know, just on a very basic level? You see, in fact, as mentioned, right, you don't have like a gate you can attach to a circuit. Instead, they're implemented on these little IC chips, also known as integrated circuits. And basically within the device itself, there are transistors that are laid out in a particular pattern and they're attached to these little pins at the edges. And those serve to be your context, be it inputs or outputs. In fact, many IC chips look basically identical. So how do we know how they work? You see, every chip actually has, you know, a code or some kind of information to identify that particular chip. What you do is that, well, you look up the data sheets for that particular chip, and probably one of the more important things is a diagram that looks something like this. Now, this is a very simplified example showing you, you know, a fictitious chip that I've just made up. The pins are labeled, and more importantly, well, the gates are actually shown to you. Critically, the first couple of pins you want to look for are the ones that actually power up the chip. Of course, without power, it's not going to work. So that's something that you will need to explore. One common notation you may see is VCC and ground. VCC is where the voltage goes in and ground is, of course, you know, how the voltage goes out. These may also be expressed as VSS and VDD, depending on, you know, what notation the chip manufacturers decide to use. Once we have that, then we have the actual components themselves. In this case, what I have are basically two AND gates, you know, very simple within this chip itself. And basically which pins represent the inputs and which pins represent the outputs are entirely dependent on these schematics. There is generally no such thing as one side being all inputs and one side being all outputs. There really isn't, you know, a definite intuitive way of how everything links together. You're just going to have to depend on the data sheet. So yeah, one last thing to cover before we delve into our actual chip and our setup. You see, you can install a chip both ways. Generally, there is nothing preventing you from installing a chip upside down. To indicate the correct direction of a chip, what we do is we look for a little notch at the top. Most chips have this, not necessarily all because, well, even one of those I got didn't. But usually, a little notch is made on the chip itself to indicate which direction is up. As long as you're aligned with what the data sheet actually you know, shows you, then you know you've got your directionality correct. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at, well, the little component I have, which is actually you know, more complex than your basic gate. It is in fact what is known as a shift register. You see, the idea is sometimes you don't really have that many output pins on your you know, actual chip itself. I happen to have an Arduino Mega, which has like over 50 pins, so I'm kind of okay. But if you're using, say, an Arduino Uno or an even simpler chip, then you want to be kind of economical with your output pins. This becomes a problem when you want to drive a large amount of outputs. For example, if you have eight LEDs, realistically, you will need at least eight pins in addition to ground. You know, to have a complete circuit for each LED that you can then control in code. However, if you want to use less pins, well, that's where this chip actually helps you. Instead of individually toggling, you know, each LED on and off using separate pins and sending either ones or zeros, what you can do is instead, you can actually send, well, the instructions for each LED sequentially to the chip. 
using just one data light. Your chip basically needs to connect to each individual LED, of course, and then simply remember the instructions that you've streamed to it, and then distribute them to the correct LED. So the magic that really makes this component work is the fact that there are a whole bunch of D flip-flops inside it. And so let's actually sort of take a look at our little Logisim simulation here to better understand how this works. So let's start with a single D flip-flop just to sort of, you know, trigger your memory on how this works. Essentially, we have a clock as well as a data line. The output here takes on the value from the data line as long, of course, as our clock is being toggled. So as you can see, the moment I've toggled my clock, the output goes through. And it will not do so until, well, the clock is pulsed. So with that in mind, we can now take a look at basically half of how our circuit works. So I have a whole bunch of D flip-flops here. These are now sort of grayed out, right? We just treat them as black boxes. The idea is this. Every D flip-flop is chained to the next one, and they all share a common clock. What this means is, if I were to now set my data input to high, and I were to pulse the clock once, see, now the first D flip-flop takes on that value. Now let's bring the data back to low, right? And every time I pulse the clock, what is going to happen is that piece of data is going to get shifted forwards. This is the idea in which our shift register actually works. The idea is every piece of information you give it goes in and gets pushed through. So, you know, whatever values I want to set, I can go ahead and set it on the data pin. And then the moment I actually pulse my clock, that piece of input goes into the system and it will stay in the system for eight counts, right? Eight clock pulses until, well, there is nowhere else to go and it just drops off. And that's why it's called a shift register, right? It's basically everything just getting shifted through. So this, as mentioned, is half the circuit. These don't actually represent the outputs. Instead, they represent the internal state because for the chip itself, what we have is another set of 8D flip-flops. So this might be a bit confusing, right? Why would we want to do that? And the reason is simple. We don't connect our internal state directly to our outputs because if we do so, we'll actually see everything shifting and we don't necessarily want to do that. And so what we have are, well, a whole bunch of other D flip-flops. So basically, I can freely load whatever information I want into the internal state. So let's load 8 bits that are alternating, right, 2 off, 2 on, and so on and so forth. Notice that they don't go out to the output just yet until I pulse a different clock. Again, these are D flip-flops. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna take the value that's coming in the moment we actually pulse the clock. And all these input values come from the internal state of all the D flip-flops that we are using for shift operations. So yeah, right now, everything is still zero. The moment I pulse this clock, everything comes on. I can then go ahead and work on my data again Right, let's now alternate, you know, what we used to have. Of course, that doesn't appear on our actual outputs until we pulse our store clock again. And that's why if we were to actually go back to this diagram we've looked at earlier, we actually need three pins. One for us to pass in the actual data, one to shift the data along our, you know, internal state shift registers, as well as a store clock to push everything towards the output. That, in a nutshell, is how this entire chip actually works. So, of course, the next thing we need to do is to use the chip itself. Just a very quick word on its connection. So, I have it in this rather messy setup, but don't be too intimidated by this. The key thing to note is the chip is right here on a breadboard. All these wires at the side are considered connected to the chip itself. You really only need to take note of the three main ones, which are of course our clocks, as well as our data pins, which are going to pins 2, 3, and 4 on the Arduino. Of course, there is power as well, and all this is going to an array of 8 LEDs as output. So okay, what we're going to try and implement is what we've seen in a simulation earlier on, and that is, 
Well, the set of LEDs lighting up in adjacent pairs. So yeah, like what you're seeing on screen right now. So let's begin with our setup process. Now, what I like to do, and you know, it's generally good practice to do so, is to, you know, create some constants representing your pin numbers. So that makes your code a little bit easier to read. In our setup function, all we are doing is we're saying that we want all these three pins to be output pins, which of course makes sense, right? Because that is, you know, where we're going to actually write our outputs to. Now, we're going to actually write our own pulse function. Technically, this isn't necessary because, you know, the Arduino actually lets you do a shift in function, so you don't have to think about any of the whole clock pulsing thing. But we're going to actually build it ourselves because we want to have a better understanding. Now, because this is C, we're going to need to have our little function prototype at the top of the document. Not to worry too much about that, the actual implementation looks like this. Essentially, we pass it a pin number. We tell it that we want to, you know, bring that pin high and then wait for a very tiny amount of time before bringing it back down to low. So as you can imagine, we are giving, you know, the specified pin a little pulse. And that is how we're going to do clocking. So yeah, later on, when we try to advance our clock, we just need to call the pulse function on the appropriate pin. So we want to build our alternating on and off LEDs. Basically, the idea is we start by setting our output pin to low, and then we're going to pulse our shift clock twice. And what that means is on the first pulse, we're going to actually push a low into our internal state. Pulse it again, we push yet another low in. Of course, the older one moves forward. Now we're going to set our output pin to high. Now when we pulse the shift clock, what we're doing is we're pushing a high in. And again, everything is getting pushed backwards. Pulse it again, that happens again. I think you have a good picture of what's happening now. We're going to bring the pin back to low and then pulse it twice again. Bring it to high, pulse it twice again. And this completes our building of our internal state. Of course, don't forget we are seeing none of this just yet, which is why we need to actually pulse the store clock now. And this pushes the internal state towards the outputs. And this is of course the first time in which we can actually see it. We wait for a quarter of a second before moving on to the next part, which really looks exactly the same, except now instead of saying low, high, low, and high, we have now swapped it around. And so the effect is, well, a different set of LEDs are on, a different set are off. Again, the method used here is exactly the same, we set our data pin and then pulse twice and then, well, repeat that until we have repopulated our entire state of the internal memory. Of course, again, in order to see our results, we're going to have to pulse the store clock and then wait again so that, you know, we can actually see the results. So all of this code I've just described actually goes under a fairly long loop function. Of course, well, if you aren't familiar with how Arduino works, the loop function gets repeatedly called. So yeah, this is sort of the first set of our animation. We wait a while, and then we do our second set. Wait a while, and then that's it. And what's going to happen is, well, it will automatically loop again and start from the top. So all that remains now is to actually, well, upload this code to the Arduino and see it in action. And there you go. That is basically, well, our code running on an Arduino you know, it's feeding the chip, and we're seeing the outputs on a bunch of LEDs. Now, I actually have a little challenge for you, and that is we've actually done quite a bit of redundant things in our code. So my challenge for you is to actually attempt to make things simpler. If you sort of understood the whole shifting concept, this shouldn't be too difficult for you. You can actually reduce the code by many lines. So definitely do give this a shot, all program downloads can be found in the video description, including the answer for this challenge I've just given you. So yeah, give it a try, you know, think it through. Once you have the idea in your head, well, check it against what I have, and let me know if you did figure it out. There are a few other pins we haven't discussed, but they are, you know, fairly non-critical to how everything hangs together. We have an enable chip, obviously if it's not enabled, nothing will work. We have a reset chip, which just, you know, resets the internal state. And we actually also have an extra output pin, 
which actually carries the last value that was pushed out of all the shift registers. The purpose of this is to help you chain this to another similar chip. So if you have another one of these chips and you chain that there, then you can sort of extend you know, the amount of information that is actually being held there. If you have another same chip, what you can then do is by using the same clock pulse, you can basically, well, move the information further into the next chip. So yeah, again, this is a very, very quick summary, right? Because this isn't really a tutorial on how to use this particular chip. But hopefully it shows you how, you know, ICs in general work in the real world. All the code, anything relevant from this episode will be put online. So if you want to delve deep into, you know, what it actually does, you can. But yeah, other than that, hopefully this has given you, you know, a better insight into how IC chips actually work out there. Anyway, that's all there is for this particular episode. I hope you gained some insight today. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.